Today, I want to talk about a different perspective in persecution. I've been talking to you about persecution. Over the last three weeks, I've shared with you that we want to maintain our values, that we want to hold on to a a good Christian culture, and we want to maintain our faith in the midst of persecution. But today, I want to talk about the subject of authenticity. You see, uh, there's, this, there's this desire whenever it comes down to walking in the faith that we would remain authentic. In the realm of Christianity and beyond, there are some catch words out there today that people feel like that they need. And one of those words is the word authentic. We want, and you can hear this in the church, we want authentic worship. We want authentic pastors. We want authentic music. We want authentic teachers. And I think that we should have those things. But, and even the world will tell you, we want authentic people. We don't like a fake. And when we find out that somebody's fake, we feel like we have somehow been kind of undermined or cheated or deceived that this person said they were this and they were something different. And so we want authenticity. Here's the challenge of authenticity. You cannot have authenticity without simultaneously having offense. If you want me to be who I am, some of you won't like who I am. And you will be offended by what I believe, what I think, how I live. That doesn't mean that I'm pointing my finger at how you live. But just by virtue of the values that I hold, someone just asked me outside, they said, hey, when you got saved, did your personality change? I said, no, my personality is still an A-type personality. I'm still gung-ho and all that kind of stuff. But my values massively shifted and my beliefs changed a great deal. And so, yeah, it's changed a little bit of my personality, but the the core of my personality is a type A and and, and pretty excitable. But the bottom line is, if you're going to stand for being a believer there's no way then that you can agree with somebody who believes something contrary to what you believe. And that doesn't mean you're judging them. It just means you believe differently. And if you were to ever even say anything about it in today's society, you're going to be in trouble. Because, see, we talk about authenticity, but then we can't offend anybody. And today our nation operates, this nation operates on popularity. Whatever's popular at the time, that means if it's popular, it really doesn't matter what it is. Anything goes under the umbrella of that popularity. And it means that we're not only supposed to accept what goes, but we're supposed to embrace it and we're supposed to celebrate it. Is that, for example, and, and then if, if, if you're unpopular, you're supposed to keep your mouth shut and you're weird and you're strange and you ought to change your belief systems. Let me give you an example, a really modern day example. Today, it's very, very popular to be gay. And so because it is, We're supposed to embrace everything, embrace the television shows, embrace the parades, embrace the lifestyle, embrace the marriage, embrace everything, and we're supposed to celebrate it like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. On the other hand, it is not popular today to believe in the biblical teaching and the origins of biblical sexuality. That's very unpopular today, and so we're supposed to keep that to ourselves. In fact, what we're supposed to do is to release our beliefs and embrace this other stuff or suffer the consequence of it. And so you can't have authenticity because you're welcome to believe any way you want to believe, but so am I, and I'm not going to go force it down your throat. You came in by your own free will, I hope. But when you come in here, I'm going to tell you what God said, and I'm going to tell you the way God said it, and I'm going to tell you what God meant behind it. And for some, that would be a challenge. Uh, Will, people are watching us by way of internet. We have no idea who it is. Welcome. We're grateful to have you here. But you don't ever know how they're going to receive this. I'm not trying to be offensive, but if I just say something, that offense is going to be there. And so that's a reality. The challenge of of the world that we live in today is that we live in a plastic world because we can't even deal with this reality. And can I ask you a question? Would you rather that someone likes you, talks to you, agrees with you, and is your friend, not because of what you really think, 
But because the laws, the rules, the social media and stuff like that, if you were to ever express what you really think, you will pay the consequence. You might lose your job. You might lose your career. You might lose your position. You might lose your friendships. You might lose your platform. There's no telling what you'll lose. And so we just button it up and we say nothing about anything. And so you think that person likes you. Are you really okay with that sort of fake relationship? Or would you rather be liked for who you really are or disliked for who you really are? I am totally okay with people who dislike me because I love Jesus or I take a stand for Jesus. I'm totally okay with that. I respect that you don't like that. What I don't respect is this plastic world we live in. Do you think if a person doesn't say something, doesn't comment some way, doesn't say something official, you know, offensive to you that they're not thinking it? Is that what you think? I mean, we're all human, right? They're thinking that. They're thinking that. So we live in a plastic world. And Jesus says, I want you to be authentic. In being authentic, there's something you need to know. So he wrote this in John chapter 15. Look what he wrote. He says this. If the world hates you, then you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So you have to know that if, you're, if you jump in with the world, they'll embrace you. They don't care if you're a Christian or not, so long as your Christianity is not offensive, if it doesn't hold any standard or value or anything. It'll hang in there. He says, yet because you are not of this world, and here's why you're not of this world, I chose you out. I chose you out. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember what I said to you, the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master, that if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, and if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. And so it's important to recognize that Jesus says, as you come up to this persecution, I want you to remain authentic, but I want you to know that authenticity is going to cost you. It means they're going to persecute you. It means it's not going to be comfortable. It means that sometimes you're going to stand alone. That's what it means. But I still want you to do that. And I don't want you to feel like it's a strange thing that's happening. I'm telling you this right up front. And so Peter gives us now a window into these behaviors that have messed with people. And I was pretty overwhelmed by reading this from this context and really trying to look to see what is it that would cause the world to persecute me? Is it my stand on Trinitarian theology? Is it my... uh, eschatological beliefs about the end times? Is it my systematic theology? Is it something like that? But, you know, in all reality, it's not. It is not the the deep, heavy things of Scripture or beliefs about salvation or any of those kind of things that I would be persecuted for. I would be persecuted for a very different reason. And Peter says, hey, I want to share with you what those are. Okay? Now, I have three things that I want to share with you this morning. The first being the source of this persecution. So number one, the root of persecution is nonconformity. The root of persecution is nonconformity. If you're going to be persecuted, it is going to be because you are making somebody uncomfortable. It's as simple as that. You are making somebody uncomfortable Not with pointing a finger, not with judgment, not with that, but just by being what you are. This is really an identity issue and being comfortable with your identity. You'll never be comfortable with who you are until you decide to be who Jesus said you are. If you can't do that, you'll be living your life trying to be what others say you are. And then you'll be bounced all over the place as you move from relationship to relationship. You'll have to constantly change who you are so that you'll be, you know, amenable to whomever you are with. And Jesus says, no, if you're going to be my child, I want you to be my child. And as a result, you're not going to conform to the world. Let me remind you of what he said, what the Bible's already told us about conformity or nonconformity. The apostle Peter says it this way in verse 14 of chapter 1. He says, as obedient children, not conforming to your former lust as you did in the days of your ignorance, but as he has called you who is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. So he says, remember, I don't want you conforming to these things you used to do. Now that you've been called out, I want you not to do that anymore. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he said, 
to the people that God foreknew, he also predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. And so we got this, this kind of a contrast over here. Don't conform to the way you were in your former lust, but be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so we have a simple challenge here, conform or don't conform. That's pretty much a simple challenge. But then, then when we get down to what Peter is saying, remember it's in the context of, of persecution, look at verse, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. This is kind of the main passage we're looking at this morning. And here's what he says. This is his conclusion to all of his teaching. He says, therefore, since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. So I want you to think like Jesus. And then he says, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if you're still sinning, you probably won't suffer. If you quit sinning, you're probably going to suffer. And he says that, we should, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So we have a choice over here. You can live in lust or you can live to the will of God. And then he says this, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we, and here's how he's going to describe the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And look at verse 4. In regard to these. In regard to, the, in regard to what? In regard to lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. And so the bottom line is, when you look at this passage, you're going to begin to realize that Peter says, yes, Nero was pointing us out, and yes, Nero charged us with the burning of Rome, but it is not the burning of Rome that we're being persecuted for. We're being persecuted by Caesar for that, to cast blame. But once the government puts a, a, a finger on you, then it gives a permission for everybody else to attack you. And the general person that is out there, the Gentile nations that are out there, they're like, you make us uncomfortable in what we consider the more enjoyable parts of our life. And we don't appreciate it. We're going to persecute you for it. Now, there's, I've got to explain this. I, I generally don't go here, but I need to this morning. When you look at lists in the Bible, there's two ways to interpret a list. Because if you look through your Bible, you'll discover both of these figures of speech are in there. And Peter uses them both. But one of them is called an asyndeton. That's not really important, other than it's a contrast to one that's called a polysyndeton. And what that means is that in this list, there is a word that's not in there, a connecting word that's not in there. And in this list, there's a connecting word that is in there over and over and over and over again. And what does that mean? That means when you see the one that's over here without the connecting word, you're to take the whole list as a whole, not pointing at each one individually, and you're to look at what that whole list describes, an underlying principle. Over here, you're supposed to look at each individual thing. And here's... Here's how he wrote it. He's like, you know, revelries, lust, drinking parties, idolatries, abominable idolatry. And so it's just a list. And then over here in another place, he'd say, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, trust. And to trust, hold it. And, to, and he would go on. If I was going to talk about, I want to talk about men, women, boys, and girls. That's the list over here. I want to talk about men and women and boys and girls. And so you can see the different emphasis. This emphasis here is to take a look and say, what does this list describe? If you were to take every one of these words and look for the similarities in all of those words, here's what you would discover. You would discover that it has a boundaryless excess to it. So there's no boundary whatsoever in any of these words. When he talks about revelries, it's, you know, it's, uh, you've heard the old joke about us Southerners, if you want to know uh, the last words of a southerner who died, it's like, hey, watch this, right? You've heard that? Or there's no southerners in here. <laughs> there's no limit to what we'll do. There's no limit in our lust. There's no limit in our revelries. There's no limit in our drunkenness. There's no limit in our abominable idolatries. There's no limit in our drinking parties. It's just beyond the limits. There's nothing that, we can, that we'll ever stop doing. And so what, you, what he's trying to get across is this this boundaryless kind of life. And you can hear it in us today. It's my body. It's my life. I can do anything that I want to with it. It is none of your business. I can live my own life any way that I want to and do anything that I want to. It's my body. And yet Jesus would say this 
Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God and that you were bought with a price and that you are not your own and therefore you should carry this body around in such a way that it will be used for God? What he's saying is that for the believer, there's not this moving kind of target out there, but there's an anchor for our soul that we reference our life off of a non-moving object. And that non-moving object is the consistency of Jesus Christ, the solidarity in his word, the unchangeable nature of who he is. And when we look at our life, there's just certain things like, no, we're not going to do that. And so what ends up happening is whenever you put a believer who's living a believer's life into the midst of people that are not, and that's not a judgment, that's just a normal thing, then they cause people to be uncomfortable. I'm no longer the life of the party. In fact, the party doesn't start until I'm gone. And that's why I leave most of the time very, very early because I can hear people, when's the pastor leaving? No problem, I'm done. I'm gone, it's okay. And I'm not judging you. I'm just saying that I'm not the life of the party because I want to be a person who shines the life of Jesus, not the life of the Gentiles. I want to shine Christ's life. And so he says, hey guys, you got to understand something. The very source of this persecution comes from making other people uncomfortable by not saying anything, not pointing your finger, but just by owning that, you ha- that the, the relationship that you have with Christ means something to you. And it's something that has stepped beyond you, that it reaches further along than that. So if you start suffering persecution for what you choose to just stand for, not what you will do or won't do, just what you stand for and what you live for. If you suffer persecution, what what is your perspective in that? Secondly, I want you to see your perspective in persecution should be authenticity. It ought to be real. See, the world likes real people. They like genuineness. Now, they don't understand all the dynamics that go along with it, the fact that you can't really be genuine and not offend somebody. And it's not like you're trying to offend somebody. It's just that they'll be offended. And that's okay. But you've got to be authentic in your life whenever you go through there. In verses 12 and 13, Jesus said this, or Peter said this. He said, beloved, watch his wording. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with joy. James said it this way, um, count it all joy. When you go through various trials and various persecutions, because there's an end result to this. There's something that's out there on the end. It's verifiable feedback. So let me give you two things that you don't want to do or that you want to do or don't do in the midst of this persecution to be authentic. Number one, don't be a victim. Don't be a victim. A victim is a person who is innocent and they're being harmed for something they did not do. A true witness for Jesus Christ is not innocent. We are guilty of believing in Jesus. We are guilty of standing for Jesus. So it shouldn't catch us off guard whenever this persecution comes back our way. I've created a syndrome for victims because there's a lot of victims in this world today. Uh, When I walk outside here, I can just say what I believe and the next thing I know, uh, you know, you're this religious bigot and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, I didn't, I'm just standing for, I was talking about my wife one Sunday because I gotta be honest with you guys, I am one happily married man. I really am. I love my wife. I wouldn't want to be married to anybody else. I look forward to seeing her at night, in the daytime, at work. I look forward to seeing her everywhere. We were uh, eating at Cracker Barrel the other day, and I went to pay the bill. And Terry's very helpful. <laughs> did you, that, guys, did you hear what I just said? You need to tuck that one away. Terry is very helpful. Uh, she doesn't realize sometimes that I know how to do something, so she helps me. And most of the time, I appreciate that, you know? And so <laughs> she's like, you got to put the tip and stuff. I was like, I got it, okay? And so the lady at the Cracker Barrel was looking at me kind of funny. like, And so Terry, I said, hey, that's just us. We love to pick at each other. That's always the way that we've been. So I've been married for 38 years. That's the, one, that's the love of my life. I couldn't live without her. Don't want another wife. I, I adore that woman. And the lady at the counter started crying. 
And, and, and she said, that is the sweetest thing. I know she watches Hallmark. You know, it's guaranteed she watches Hallmark. But I love my wife and talking about my wife and then somebody came after me that I didn't promote another kind of lifestyle. I said, I wasn't even thinking, come on. But that's just the way that it is. It's the way that it is. So they told me I hurt them. Now listen, listen, listen. I have developed a syndrome. I figure if the medical community can develop a syndrome for everything that goes on, so can I. And I'm being serious. It's not a funny thing. This is a genuine syndrome that I have studied and watched over the years, and I have finally been able to put a name to it. I call it smashed thumb syndrome, okay? Now, I'm going to explain it to you. I, don't do this, okay? I just want you to look at your thumb, your own thumb, and I want you to do this, okay? Just do that. You know, hit it or that or shake a hand, whatever. Does that bother anybody in here? Y'all all good? Now, if I were to come out and shake your hand, it wouldn't bother you. You'd be fine, right? I'm sure you'd be fine. Now, if I ask one of you to come up here and put your thumb down on this table or this platform, and I took a big ball-peen hammer and just smacked that thing, it'd turn red or black and blue, and it'd start growing, and you, you can already feel the throb, can't you? You ever had your thumb throbbing? If, you're, if you do any kind of construction work, you know, when you hear that thump, 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 boom, then you're waiting for what's going to, mm, because you know you just got that thumb, and that thing hurts. Now, here's the question. After you smash that thumb, if I were to touch it like that, would it hurt? Yeah. If I did like that, would it hurt? If I played thumb wars, would it hurt? Yeah. If I shook your hand, would it hurt? Of course it would. And you know what you say? Stop, you're hurting me. You know what I'd say? No, I'm not. You're hurt. Before you were hurt, none of that bothered you. None of that bothered you. Now that you're hurt, it bothers you. And guess what? The only way that you can deal with a person who is hurt like that, because I don't care if you touch them light, touch them hard, anywhere you touch them, it hurts. The only way that you can safely deal with a person like that is to avoid them. If you want to help them, then you have to understand they're going to blame you for all your hurt, for all of their hurt. I've got a saying that goes along with it. Hurting people are hurt by everybody, even though they're hurt by nobody. And that's a challenge. So as a Christian, when we walk out there into the world and we have discovered the truth and we know who Christ is and we know what our future is and we, we, we've been in, we, we receive this life that Jesus gave us, when we walk out there and they see our life, we hurt them. We hurt them. But you're not hurting them. They're hurting and I don't care how gentle or how heavy that you touch them, hurting people are hurt by everybody, even when they're hurt by nobody. They're hurt by, you can tell. You can tell. They'll always talk about their pain. They'll always talk about their suffering. They'll always talk about their childhood. They'll always talk about what happened to them. They'll always talk about who's done them wrong. They'll talk about all that stuff because that's what's in them. That's the pain and the poison that's on the inside. And so well, here's what Jesus says. Don't be a victim. Don't have hurt. Don't have smash thumb syndrome. Because this is not a pain in you. This is life in you. This is something good inside of you. And so you should not have pain. You should not be a victim. Okay? So what do we do then? Secondly, here's what you should do. You should do what is right always and trust the results to God. That's what you should do. 1 Peter 4, 19 says this. Let those who are suffering according to the will of God Commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Which means that you're going to realize that whenever something's going wrong, you are going to say, I realize that I'm not going to get my reward today, but that reward is somewhere out there in the future, and I'm going to commit what I'm doing right now to the Lord, and he'll remember it even when I've forgotten it. And on the appropriate day, he's going to give something to me, but it's not going to be today. And we're very familiar with doing this because, I want you to think about this. If you have children... If you have a child that you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an airplane pilot, a builder, whatever you want them to be, you're going to put them in school, right? And so they go to school in kindergarten or first grade, and they go through all 12 years of school. In the fifth grade, do you say, 
I see you walk around and you're all mad. I'm like, what are you mad? My son is in the fifth. He's been in school for five years, six years, including kindergarten, nine years if we want to talk about preschool. And he is still not a doctor. I'd be like, uh, you realize he ain't going to be a doctor when he graduates high school. That, that you got to go to medical school, and that's going to be minimum of seven years before probably being a doctor by then. they got residencies and stuff like that, and then they got to get a, an appointment, whatever. And so we already know that, man, there, there could be anywhere from 17 to 20 years that we're doing stuff, and we're really not expecting the benefit from that until we get to the end of it. You realize until you get your MD, you can't be an MD, Right? And so while we're going through life right now, you can't expect God to give you all these blessings whenever we haven't actually done anything yet to get them. And here's the reason that God waits. I'll tell you why. You don't always want God to give you the blessing for what you did on the day that you did it because God's got a compounding interest program that's out of this world. Do you realize that you get credit for the people that you have influenced for Jesus Christ when you get to heaven, the reason that nobody, listen care, nobody has been judged yet. Nobody. Not from Adam and Eve has a single soul yet been judged. I'll tell you why. God doesn't know what your life has amounted to yet. He doesn't know you. How would you like to be the apostle Paul? The apostle to the Gentiles. Every single time a person gets saved, Anywhere in the world that's a Gentile or that comes from the Apostle Paul's teaching, he gets credit. He's a multi-gazillionaire in, in terms of souls in heaven. And so your life has yet to be determined what it's going to be. And God says, in the appropriate time, I'm going to bless you. But right now, I just want you to understand, continue to do what's right and just trust me with those results because one day it's going to come to you. But then I want to go a, a, a further step Peter does something strange to me. In the beginning of this letter, he says to the pilgrims who are dispersed throughout the areas of Asia. And it's the, what we call the diaspora. But then in chapter 5, he switches audiences. So he stops talking to all those people and he begins to talk to the elders. He begins to talk to the leaders of the church that are in all these places where he's talking about. And so I want you to feel that shift. I want you to understand that what I'm getting ready to say is not so much for you as it is for me, as it is for other pastors and staff members and stuff like that, the things that Peter is saying. So thirdly, I want you to see that in persecution, I have you must remember the value of your platform, and I think you should, but I really think that that applies mainly from what Peter is saying to people like me, that we should value this platform. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, I want you to hear this, and I want you to hear this in the context of spending four chapters talking to the man's congregation and telling them what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to live, how they're supposed to get persecuted, how they're supposed to measure up underneath it. And then he comes and he shares with these elders. This passage has been used multiple times, divorced from its context, and I think that's a challenge. So I want to keep it in its context. Listen to what it says. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. So he's speaking to these people in a letter, but he's speaking vicariously through these, through these people to these elders. And he says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So he says, I'm, I'm saying this to myself, and I saw Jesus actually die. And then he says, and also a partaker of the glory which is to come, which means I am presently being persecuted for the very things that I'm asking this congregation to, to measure up under. I'm suffering that same persecution, but he sees it as glory. And then he says this, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over them, of those entrusted to you, but as being examples to the flock. Now, here's what I want you to recognize what Peter is saying. These are, when he came to, the, to the, these people, he's saying, I realize that you guys are not presently doing this. I know that. And so I'm giving you some encouragement, some instruction to come over here and stop conforming to this form of lust and kind of live this kind of life out. But the elders weren't doing it either. And so he comes to them and he says, guys, I want you to be aware of something. You need to value the platform that you have. Do you realize that if, we ever if I were to lose this platform that God gave me, I would be lucky over the course of a lifetime ever to gain it back. 
ever to gain your trust back. If I violate your trust, what's the likelihood you'll give it back to me? It's possible. But who knows if we'll ever get it back or not. And so we need to value this platform and recognize there's something to lose. Think about scope and scale. What is the scale of your platform? How large is that platform? And then what is the scope? How far does it reach? And, and depending on the scope and scale of your platform, if you ever lose it, you may get something back, but it may be of a smaller scale and a smaller scope you don't ever know. And Peter comes back and he says, guys, and listen very carefully to the way that he says this. He says, the elders who are among you shepherd the flock of God serving as an overseer. May I ask a question? Why didn't Peter say, serve as an overseer over the flock of God and shepherd them? That would have been radically different. Radically different. He said, you shepherd, and this is the verb, shepherd that flock, serving as an overseer. He didn't say serve as an over, or be an overseer and serve as a shepherd. The reason is that these elders, the pastors were missing among the congregation. They were missing among the persecution. The congregation were sitting there telling you what to do, but you wouldn't find us out there with you while you're being persecuted. And so he says, guys, listen, this is not a professional ministry. I don't need you in this office of overseer like a, some kind of dictator looking over these people, telling them what to do like a general in an army. You are to shepherd these people. And they understood the picture of a shepherd is the shepherd is always with the sheep. The shepherd is among the sheep. The shepherd smells like sheep. The shepherd knows his sheep. The shepherd anoints their head with oil. The shepherd takes a hook and pulls them out of danger. The shepherd takes a rod and breaks their leg to keep them from danger if necessary. He said, guys, where are you? Your congregation is out there suffering and they don't even know who you are. They don't even know your name. You're not there. You need to get in there and shepherd that flock of God and serve as an overseer, an episkopos, one who does have oversight of the church and sets the direction for the church. Yes, you're supposed to do that, but that's not your first responsibility. Your first responsibility is to shepherd that flock. And then he says, in shepherding that flock, there's three ways that I want you to do it. Three ways that I want you to do it. I don't want you to have to do it by compulsion but willingly. Now, why would Peter say that? Peter would say that because whenever it comes to ministers sometimes, it is so easy to feel like that this is some kind of a, a place where we just get paid to do this and we're like high flute and people or something. And he says, no, no, I want you to understand. I want you to do this because you want to, not because you have to. If you have to set a set of rules and guidelines and structures to get a staff member or a pastor to do something, they should just quit. Because Peter said, I don't, if I have to force you to do it, it's the wrong way to be. You have to do it willingly. You should want to do this. You know, whenever I preach up here, it's like, I've had people tell me, you don't really have a lot of, of, of guest preachers in here. Don't you trust anybody? I was like, you know, I really never thought about it that way. I just like to preach. I want to. I, I get messages in the office and I'm thinking, man, this is going to help them. This is gonna, I, I, I want to I give this to my congregation. I want to do this. They're like, don't you want a break? No. I guess I never really thought about it. No. I don't. I've had people to say this. How do you preach three times on a Sunday morning? I would be worn out. Now, I've never had like a congregational member say that. But I've had other preachers tell me that. And I'm thinking, yeah, let's see. 8 o'clock, 9, 30, 11. Got to get here a little bit early. So maybe four or five hours this morning that I've been here, five hours or so. That I've been here. By the time I leave at 12, I got here, you know, at 6 o'clock. So that's, that's a whole six hours. Whew. I'm the man. Y'all really need to, like, give me a raise. Here's the thing. Here's what I want to know. I want to know how it is that you guys go out there and work 8 or 10 hours a day or more all the days of the week, whether it's building a house 
paving a road, plumbing a house, electricity, working at GE, working at Corning, flipping your shifts so that you don't ever get any sleep, working in a classroom or something like that, how you would give 40 to 45 to 50 hours a week out there and still come in here and teach a Sunday school class and still come in here and watch our nursery and still come in here and greet somebody at the door and still come in here and park somebody and still come in here and do what you do. That's what I want to know, not how does the pastor get through three sermons on a Sunday morning. Give me a break. We ought to want to do this. We ought to want to do this. And we're tired. We're tired after a couple of days. Give me a break. Peter said, pastors, come on. Where are you at? You guys are supposed to do this willingly. Not out of compulsion. And you need to understand what you're doing. Oh, your pastor, you're interfering with my family time. You're interfering with, I'm not interfering with anything. You, you accepted the call. I just never segregated my family time from my ministry. I told Andy, I said, hey, this is us. This is us. Whenever I'm out, your service is to let me be there, is to pray for me. Secondly, he said this, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, eagerly. Don't you love these words that he's using he says, not for Dennis on this game, but eagerly, eagerly wanting to do something. In other words, he's saying, what's dishonest? What, it, the dishonesty that he's talking about is in reference to chapter 4, verse 3. He says, you, you, you're living this life over here that's completely contrary to the life that Jesus gave for you. But then you step up here and, and you're getting paid to be something that you're not. You're, getting, you're, you're, you're receiving compensation and you're leading people publicly in a way that you don't live privately. And if you couldn't do it publicly, you have no business doing it privately. And when you take that pay, it's dishonest. You should eagerly want to do what God wants us to do. I'm supposed to be eager to be there for you guys in the deaths of your family, in the marriages of your family, in the birth of your children, in your growth in life on a Thursday night or on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning or, or whatever it happens to be. And I realize there's only one of us, so we can't go around, but we're supposed to eagerly be there. We're supposed to want to be there. And then lastly, he says, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but to be examples to the flock. We're not supposed to be examples to the world, but to the flock. And he says, I, I want you to understand, we didn't put you here to run ramshod over those who were entrusted to you. Let me tell you what that means. You're not mine. You're not mine. They, they got these inventions called uh, nanny cams. You know what a nanny cam is? They can put it in a lamp or in a bear or something like that. And you put it with your kids, so if you got a nanny or a babysitter or whatever, and you're not sure they're taken care of, you don't know who's watching anymore. And uh, they can tell whether you're beating your kids, beating their kids or not. And you know what they do whenever they, when you go away and you go on a date night or something like that and you hire a babysitter, you're entrusting your children to the care of somebody else. Hey, if you turned your nanny cam on and you saw somebody beating your kids, what would you do? You, you'd, uh, you'd tell the Lord, I'm going to be a Christian in about three hours, but I'm taking a vacation. And thank you. Here's what I'd say. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness already bestowed on me for what I'm getting ready to do. Right? And, and I would tell the person, here's what I want you to know. Now, you're a Christian. Yes, let me tell you what that means to me. I'm already forgiven for what I'm getting ready to do to you. And so I'm good with the Lord. <laughs> it's, but here's the thing. Why? Because those are your kids and you've entrusted. wonder what God thinks. wonder what God thinks about people like me and how I handle you and what I do with you and how I think about you. And whether I was like, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way it's going to be. Now, there's a leadership where overseers and have to do that stuff, but not as being a Lord. But you know what the world needs? It needs an example. It needs an example. It is pretty hard. Don't you, if you're working in any kind of workplace, forget the church for a minute. If you're in any kind of workplace, don't you hate it whenever the boss is always ordering you around and they never lift a finger to do anything? Oh, does that get to you at all? It should, and it does, right? Kind of gets to you. Well, same thing in the pastoral ministry. If, uh, if we're not out there kind of with you and among you and leading and being an example, 
that would be a challenge. He says, man, you guys got to do this. And James said this in James chapter 3 and verse 1. He said, let not many of you become teachers knowing that you'll receive a stricter judgment. And so he's saying, you're, you're on a higher plane here. Not in value, not in value, not in worth, in responsibility and accountability. He says, before you, before you step into this role, understand there's a higher level of accountability that you're being charged with, and you need to be aware of that. You can't just live willy-nilly any way you want to. You have to reach out there to those people. They have a need to have somebody in the trenches with them that when they're being persecuted, that they know that their leaders are going to be the first ones to take the first arrow. They're out there in the front. They're, they're on the front lines of the battle. I can assure you that the things that I share in here from the platform I'm probably the first to say I'm out here, and I say a lot of things that I know that's not always comfortable for you, but my job is to re return to you the Word of God and to return to you the way that God wants and what God likes and what God loves, and sometimes folks don't like it. It's okay, and I will stand with you as long as you're not intentionally being offensive to somebody, which then we would need to adjust to you, but just by living a holy life, if somebody comes after you, we stand right there with you. It's supposed to lead the way. In 1 Peter 4, 3... Pastors should be the first ones to not walk in lewdness, to not walk in lusts, to not be involved in drunkenness, to not walk in revelries, to not attend the drinking parties, to not engage in abominable idolatries. See, ministers cannot apply the universal principles that meet all of your needs to us because we have a higher calling and a higher standard. You cannot apply those same things to me as you could apply to you. And we have ministers and ministries that are doing it all the time. And I would ask you a question. Where are you leading people? And once you lose the platform, you'd be lucky if you ever get it back. Be lucky if you ever get it back. Paul said this, and I'll close. First Corinthians 10, he said... All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own but each other's well-being. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, he says, We then who are strong should bear the scruples of the weak. And so from a, a standpoint of growth and in persecution, there's the potential to be persecuted as a general congregational member. And there's also the potential to be persecuted as the pastoral leadership. And that persecution will come from nonconformity. Nonconformity with the world. It will be, you know what? God's pulled us aside to live a very particular way. And I think it would be a really terrible shame if there was a higher standard in the world than there is in the church. There are people today that are very, very mad with some people out there in the world that I, I don't quite get it because of all the value systems that are out there. But movie stars, how many movie stars have their careers are finished, they're over because of a charge against them from a sexual basis? How many of them are done? Uh, Bill Cosby just, just uh, sentenced, or not sentenced, but found guilty for those things. I don't think he could come back and do another Cosby show because he would not be accepted by others. They put that down whether it's a charge against President Trump or a charge against President Obama or it's a charge against any one of our political people and their careers are over. They're just over. And it, so why would we think that if the world has a standard that says we kind of do expect something out of our leaders, people that influence, that that same standard wouldn't hold true right here in the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, there's a lot at stake here. And it's not just this platform. What's at stake is the lives of people out there that need desperately to see Jesus. And they need to see somebody who loves Jesus and who walks the life for Jesus. Not pointing their fingers and not fussing at somebody else and not calling them names and doing that kind of stuff. But I mean, just in your conduct, just the way that you live your life, the way you carry yourself, that there's a testimony and a witness for Jesus Christ. I hope you could shift your perspective in persecution and live a life that is authentically Christian.